So I want to begin with gratitude and thank Wei Ting, and the president, and the provost, and all the organizing committee, and all of you who have helped out with this conference. It's a great conference, and I'm really thankful for all of you who put it together. You know, I used to skip gratitude at the beginning of my talks. I wanted to get right to the hard data, talk about research results. And then I found out that you live longer if you're grateful. So I added it back into my talk. Hopefully it works. I want to start out with two apologies today. The first apology is I really cannot cover 280 or however many studies in 35 years. I think I can answer almost all of the president's questions from research we and other people have done, but I don't have time today, so I'll just hit a few high points. Uh, the other thing I want to do is apologize to the other speakers here in various sessions. I'd love to go to all your talks. I've read the abstracts. They all look great, but I can only be in one place. But just be assured there's lots of great talks here, but I can only be at one at a time. So what we're going to talk about today, of course, is subjective well-being. People say, you can't define happiness. It's vague and all that. I say, well, maybe not happiness. That might be a vague word. But I can define subjective well-being. And what that means is how the person themselves, him or herself, evaluates, appraises his life or her life. That is, do you think your life's going well? Do you think your life's enjoyable? Do you think that your life is really what you want it to be? By your own standards, how is your life? That's subjective well-being. And you may do this with life satisfaction, sitting back, thinking about your life, thinking about what you want in life and what you have. You also do it moment to moment with your emotions. When you're enjoying life, you're happy about things, pleasantly calm and contented, that means that your system thinks your life is going well. And when you're angry, sad, super stressed out, you can't function well, that means something is missing or something's going wrong in your life. So both through emotions, your experience, and through thinking, you evaluate your life, and that's what subjective well-being is. And then there's optimism, what you expect in the future. This is the growth of the field since I got into it. And I started in 1981, and as you see here, there was almost no studies. The red line is my citation count, and the blue line is the number of studies done in the field. And as you can see, it has grown tremendously, starting around 2000, 2004, just shooting up. So we have had an enormous growth of this field. There used to be almost no interest when I first got in. Now there's tremendous interest. And beyond that, there's something else. And that is the number of, let's say, methodologically sophisticated studies has gone up at the same rate. These are longitudinal experimental studies. So we have a lot of correlational studies. We measure something, we measure something else, and we correlate them. Those studies are fine, but eventually we need to go beyond that, do experimental, longitudinal, experience sampling studies, and as you can, to get a, a more understanding of what's happening. And as you can see, those kind of studies have also gone up. So this is very encouraging. I tell people, when I die, please put this on my tombstone. And usually they don't laugh. They're like, oh my gosh, she's going to die any minute. No, I'm not going to die any minute. I'm going to live a long time. But when I do, you can, uh, you know, it just makes me happy, to, uh, very relieved to see this growth in the field. Because when I first got in it in 1981, in psychology, there was a great deal of opposition to the field. And I had a hard time for about 10 years. One of the other things I want to tell you before we begin talking about findings is, this is a field where we've learned a lot, but there's much more to learn. And I'm here as a missionary to try to get you to start doing subjective well-being research, because there's much more that we don't know. Even though we've learned a lot, there's much more we don't know. And I put on some of my slides this little uh, smiley face to show you that, boy, we really need research on that topic including cross-cultural research especially. Okay, so why is subjective well-being important? First of all, it's important because people value it. And I'll show you uh, some data, uh, uh, some results from Singapore. Secondly, in a post-materialistic world, it's becoming more important. Jobs and leisure that provide not just money, not just benefits, but growth. We now have a great deal of evidence to say, yes, money's important to people, 
but at some point it quits being as important and other things kick in. Things that interest you, expand you as a person, you grow as an individual and so forth. So we're moving more and more people are moving out of the subsistence and survival level into this level and as they do that they're going to become more and more concerned with the kind of things that we're going to talk about here at this conference. It's valuable, as Wei Ting said, because it has benefits. So not all of you know this li research literature yet, but it's not just that happiness comes from having a good marriage, but that happiness itself may cause a better marriage, and unhappiness itself may cause a worse marriage, and so forth. And we'll talk about those data as we get going here. And then it gives a broad view of quality of life. So it reflects not just economic development, not just whether we're a rich society like Singapore or the U.S., but it, it reflects the additional things that the President and Wei Ting mentioned about corruption and crime and other things in a society. So it serves as a metric beyond economic, not instead of, but to complement economic indicators of how well a society's doing. All right, so here are the Singapore data. College students in Singapore, do people value it? Singapore students rated a bunch of values for us. They rated health and wealth and having fun and leisure and having sex and all these different things they rated. And they rated happiness as number one, even above health. Health was rated number two. And around the world, happiness was rated number one overall. It wasn't rated number one in China. It was rated like two or three in China, but still very high rating in every society. So one reason for us to worry about happiness is we want the citizens to get what they value, and this is one thing they value, even higher than health, which is surprising. Now, let's talk about the causes of well-being. And this is particularly pertinent to whether we want national accounts because some people will say, well, we don't, really, well-being is an individual affair. It's up to genes, it's up to your temperament and so forth. Some people are born happy, some people are born unhappy. The government doesn't have anything to do with it. The government has no business getting into this. And what I'm gonna show you are data to suggest that even though there is a genetic component to well-being, governments have an enormous influence on your happiness, probably bigger than the influence of genetics. So here are our twins, and when they were little, they're identical twins. And one way you can look at genetics is to take identical twins like this, and sometimes, unfortunately, they get separated at birth. Ours didn't, ours grew up with us, but they get separated at birth, they get raised in very different homes, and you can bring them back together when they're 40 years old and say, how similar are they? How similar is their IQ? How similar is their happiness? And here are our twins now, and you can see that they're not exactly alike. One of them's a clinical psychologist and one's a developmental psychologist. They're both professors, right? That's about as different as they are. They are very similar. And then what the data show is that identical twins reared apart, that is in different homes, they don't know each other, they never have seen each other till they're age 40, are more alike in well-being than fraternal twins, dizygotic twins who only have half their genes in common, reared together. Wow, that's a big effect, right? So their genes definitely made a difference, otherwise they wouldn't be similar, right? And they are similar. Now, let me just assure you that that doesn't mean 50% of your happiness is under your control. That's a myth. If you've learned that, try to wipe that out of your mind right now. I, I don't have time to give a whole lecture on that. But even though heritability might be 0.5 or around there, that doesn't mean you have 50% under your control. That's about differences between individuals. But anyway, what we do know is there's a big genetic component. But going beyond that, there's also a very big effect of income and other factors of the society you live in. All right, so here is a picture of the world from the Gallup World Poll. We have the first representative sample of the world at Gallup, 165 countries, 1.5 million people, thousands of people representatively sampled from countries. And as you can see, these are life satisfaction scores. And of course, Africa it tends to be low right in here, Sub-Saharan Africa, 
Then the highest places, of course, are up in Sweden, Denmark, in this Scandinavian area, New Zealand, Australia, then the U Canada, US, et cetera, and Singapore comes in high too. So we know what places are high and low. What causes this? What is uh, behind this? And one of the things we know is behind it is income. So this is GDP per person. And as you can see, Denmark is up here at the top in terms of happiness over here in the upper right corner. United States is here, less uh, satisfied with their lives, but one of the richer countries. Singapore down here below it, pretty high up on both two. And down here we have African countries and then Middle Eastern countries that have a lot of conflict and so forth. People are not satisfied in those countries. This correlation is 0.82 between the GDP per capita of a country and how happy, how satisfied people are there. 0.82, strongest correlation in psychology, right? Very strong. So income development does lead to happiness. Also notice that this is a log scale. If it weren't, it would be curved. There would be declining marginal utility. Money would make less and less difference. We'll come back to that. And, but by making it log, it makes it a straight line. But there are huge differences between individual countries that show that it's not all just genetics. Look at this difference right here. This is Denmark and Togo. Togo is a small African nation down by Ghana, and it's the least satisfied country in the world in the Gallup World Poll. There's some other places that are just about the same. And then here is Denmark. This is a zero to 10 scale. This is your, your life is close to your ideal. This is your life is terrible down here at zero. And as you can see, Danes, most of them score an eight, some score a nine and 10, some score a six and seven, almost none score below six. Whereas you can see in Togo, almost none score above six. So there's almost no overlap here. Almost all Danes are more satisfied with their life than all Togolese. Amazing, right? Don't say it's all genetics. You don't think that Togolese just got bad genes and Danes all got good genes, right? That's pretty hard to buy. But we know that's not true because if you look at immigrants who transfer countries who go from Togo to the USA, we see over time their satisfaction going up a lot. So we know that it's not just genes because the differences are huge and they cannot be attributed just to, well, countries have different genetic makeup, which would seem preposterous anyway that they would be that big, but because when they immigrate, their happiness goes up and starts matching the people where they have moved to. So very strong evidence that it's not just genetic. Now, let's talk about what the president talked about, about beyond money. So it's not just money. And these are brand new data, a couple weeks old, and we've just submitted this paper, so it's not even accepted yet. And what we have in the world is you see income going up to very high incomes. For the first time, we have a big enough N, big enough number of subjects to establish the line up at these very high numbers of income. You needed a million and a half people to find sufficient numbers of people with incomes above 160,000, and look what we start seeing with life satisfaction. First of all, the three lines are education. The blue, least educated. The red, most educated. So you see education makes some difference separate in these data from income. You also can see that happiness is going up from 10,000 up to 160,000. It's going up. And then for some reason, after 160, it starts to turn down a little bit again. We don't know why. We can't explain it yet. We haven't analyzed it enough to figure this out. People say, why is that? That's kind of interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting. Maybe it's the president up there flying around to Taiwan, and he st says he's stressed out. So here, we don't know what his salary is, I guess, but it might be, it might be up here somewhere. And uh, just guessing. But remember, too, that these are very, very high salaries because these are from around the world. So if you're making $300,000 in an African country, right, you are a very unusual individual. And we see this downturn in happiness. So this is our first evidence that there's something important beside money going on, whether it's stress or what it is, we're not sure yet. 
Here is some findings that Wei Ting just sent me this week. Again, on the Gallup World Poll. Beyond money, the Easterland paradox. As you know, the Easterland paradox says, hey, if we're increasing in, in income over time, how come we're not going up in happiness? Well, we find out that you are going up in happiness when we get enough countries involved, 165, except that it only works for life satisfaction. We found no effect of rising income on positive and negative affects. Somehow countries have enough income now to have an enjoyable life and to get rid of the worst negative affect coming from hunger and so forth. But life satisfaction depends on your standards. So if you want to be like Donald Trump, a billionaire, you know, you may be dissatisfied all and get more and more satisfied as you go up above a million dollars. But positive and negative affect, not so much. So that's another little bit of we're moving beyond money. Another way that we move beyond money is with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So you've all seen Maslow's hierarchy. And you know at the bottom you have basic needs. You can eat and that. And then you have security and relationships and growth and, 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 and on at the top, self-actualization. And the interesting thing is we find that though meeting those needs predicts well-being around the world in all countries. Each one of those. Security, actually, the least so. I'm not sure why in our data. But each one of Maslow's needs predicts happiness in virtually every country we've examined. But there's one big but about it, and that is that they don't emerge in the order Maslow said. You don't have to have food before relationships matter. Relationships matter from day one. Even if you're hungry, relationships still matter. You don't have to have relationships or safety before growth, mastery, et cetera, matter. So they're all there all the time. So we rewrote this as, look, they're all just scrambled together. All these needs come together all the time in a person. And let me give you an example of this man that we interviewed, slums of Calcutta. You can see his house there, shanty. He's in the slums. He makes one, two, or three dollars a day. Minaj is his name, and our son interviewed him, got to know him well. And Minaj says, some days I only make one dollar pulling a rickshaw in Calcutta. In those days, we don't have quite enough mo money to eat for our family. When we make three dollars, we got enough money to eat. Okay. So he's got a tough life, and I could tell you stories about it. It's even tougher than that. Really a tough life. And then you say, Minaj, how satisfied are you with your life? And he says, oh, a seven or eight. And you're like, what? How could you be a seven or eight? It's impossible. He doesn't understand the scale, or the scales are no good. No, Minaj says, listen, you think my poverty and my hunger defines me and who I am, but it doesn't. I'm more than poverty. I also have my kids. I love them so much. When I bring them home a candy and they squeal with happiness, it makes my heart so happy. And I love my wife, and I like our neighbors, and I have religion. He says, I have all these things in my life. Sure, I would be more satisfied if I had more money, but these other things are important to me now. So rewriting Maslow's theory to say that all the needs are there and all those things are important even when you don't have enough money. Another thing that we know, talking about the president's questions before I talked, is that being congruent with your culture matters a lot for your happiness. So Marissa Diener, one of our daughters, I showed you her picture, and I published a study back around 95, and it showed that self-esteem mattered a lot in America. In fact, self-esteem was the number one predictor of subjective well-being when we did that study in America. And then we looked at India and women in India, and the correlation was almost zero. We were floored. We couldn't believe it. We said, wait, self-esteem, that's got to be everywhere in the world, right? So our son interviewed people in Calcutta and Kerala, southern India, and he asked this woman, how can you be satisfied with your life, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and not be so satisfied with yourself? And she said, you know, all us traditional, all we traditional women know how to do what we're supposed to do. We know how to cook, take care of the kids, we're in charge. We're all, we're, our self-esteem is just fine, but we, you know, we don't think about that a lot. How my sons are doing, now that's important to me. 
and they're over in Dubai and they're working in that. That is important to my life satisfaction, but my self-esteem doesn't matter. And all of a sudden, we saw our cultural blinders that we had thought self-esteem was universal, and it turned out to be culture-specific. And we saw this in countries around the world. Other people have replicated that, where self-esteem is a very good predictor in individualized countries, individualistic countries, and much less so in collectivist countries and so forth. Wow. That was an eye-opener for us. Now we've gone on, and I'll just tell you about some results on religiosity and extroversion. So the anthropologist Ruth Benedict, a long time ago, one of my favorite anthropologists said, if you fit into your culture, it's easier for you. So if you're a funny guy and you're making jokes and outgoing and all that, you're going to be okay in a culture that's like that. But if you're in a very quiet culture, you may have a tougher time. Maybe people may think you're obnoxious, et cetera. So now we found evidence of that in religiosity. So what we found was, in the US, all the studies show that religious people are a bit happier. And there's lots of studies, and they mostly show that, on average, religious people in the US are happier. I've done one of those, and uh, you know, I found the same thing. But then what we found in the world poll was a little different. If you are religious in a highly religious society, you're going to be happier. But if you're religious in a non-religious society, it doesn't matter, or you might be slightly less happy. Here are the data. So over here on the left are highly religious societies, the top 25% in the world. Places like Saudi Arabia, where 98% of people said religion's important in my life, and 98% said, I went to church services this week, right? Very religious. Over here, you have the least religious places in the world on the right, and those are places like Sweden, where 15 or 20% say, I went to church or it's important. Most people, 80% say, no, it's not important to me anymore. You know, I, I, you know, sometimes I go to church just to fit in and all that, but really, it's not important, and I usually don't go to church. So now we have the religious people in the religious countries and their positive feelings and the, the, the amount, and then the non-religious people in those countries. And as you can see, the non-religious people in a religious society are in trouble. Their positive feelings are way lower. You can see by the air bars, everything here, with huge uh, sample sizes, everything's significant. But the point here is, if you're in Saudi Arabia and you're an atheist, right, you're in trouble because you don't fit in. You don't fit into the group. There may be people who are prejudiced against you, etc. However, in Sweden, actually being non-religious is just fine. You might even be slightly happier than the religious people, but basically not much difference between the two groups. This is cultural congruence. We find over and over around the world, fitting into society, going beyond income, fitting into society is important. And we found the same thing for extroversion. You can see that this guy's an extrovert, but his girlfriend's bored to death with him, falling asleep with him. But um, here's the point. We found that extroversion correlated with positive emotions in every country we studied, every country. But in some countries, it was very weak, barely significant, like 0.08 correlation. In other countries, quite strong, 0.35 or whatever. But the interesting thing was, and uh, Ashley Fulmer actually over at NUS is the lead author on this study, that uh, we found that extroverts are even more happy in extroverted societies. That's where they really do well. And in introverted societies, they're only a tiny bit happier. And there's much more uncertainty. So again, cultural congruence. Okay, so life circumstances make a big difference. But do we want people to be happy? Do we really think it's a good thing? Or is it silly? It distracts us from work. We're out trying to have fun. We're drinking, having sex, or taking drugs. God knows what we're doing, and it's a bad thing, right? That's a possibility. So Gustave Lebert, this grouchy-looking guy here who wrote Madame Chatterley's Lover, said, to be stupid, selfish, and have good health are three requirements for happiness, though if stupidity is lacking, all is lost. In other words, he thinks stupidity is a prerequisite for happiness. He thinks if you're happy, you're stupid because you don't understand how the world really is out there. You don't understand the big bad world if you're so happy. And other people agree with him. 
Dear Mom and Dad, thanks for the happy childhood. You've destroyed any chance I had of becoming a writer, right? You have to be unhappy and miserable to be a writer or a painter. Or, whoa, I thought I had one more funny slide. I don't have it here. Uh, so uh, the other one is a picture of Despondex, a drug you can take if you're, it's a joke, but it's a drug you can take if you're too happy and you can quit looking like an American and look a little more sour and so forth. So what we find in our research is exactly the opposite. Not that happy people are dumb people, not that happy people do badly, but they do better on average. Of course, there's many individual exceptions, but on average, they are healthier, they live longer, they have better relationships, they're more creative, they're better citizens, they have better mental health and resilience and higher work productivity. That is amazing. Happy people generally do much better than depressed or angry people for sure. It doesn't mean you have to be super happy over there laughing and all that all the time, but it means you have to be content and positive most of the time. So this is the most famous. How many of you have heard of the Nun Study? So a lot of you haven't. So let me tell you about the Nun Study. I take credit for it. I didn't actually do the Nun Study, but I accepted it as the editor of the journal, JPSP. So now people think it's my study, but really I didn't do it. And what they did was they studied nuns starting at age 75 and see how long they lived. But they looked at the nuns back when they entered the convent at age 22, and they got their autobiography, why they joined the nunnery. And what they found was that some of the nuns were really happy in their autobiography at age 22. They said things like, oh, I love God so much, and I want to serve people and help the world. And it was all this positive stuff. And other nuns would say things like, you know, I don't want to go to hell, and I feel guilty, so I want to become a nun, so I avoid temptation, and all this sort of negative imagery. They then rated those on happiness and saw how long the nuns lived. The cheerful, happy nuns live 10 years longer than the unhappy nuns. Now, this is impressive to me for two reasons. First of all, the nuns all live under the same circumstances, right? They, they, they eat the same food. They live in the same houses together, the happy and unhappy nuns. It's not like some of them are rich and some of them are poor. They all live in the same way. And the second reason why it's so impressive is the happiness data come from age 22. So when these researchers say, oh, well, you get the data, and that's because they're already a little bit sick, and they don't know it, and so they're unhappy, and that's why they die quicker. No, the nuns from 22 to 75, right, they had to make it 50 more years. They were healthy at time one, and yet it predicted. So then the other question is whether you say, well, these are Catholic nuns, right? They're not like you are. They don't drink a lot, smoke a lot, gamble a lot, do all these bad things a lot, right? They're just pretty clean living. What about a normal group of people, more like us, psychologists, right? Well, I don't know if they're actually normal. They probably aren't very normal. But you see, these were famous psychologists. Here's Freud, for example. So Sarah Pressman found their autobiographies in, in books and so forth. So they're all famous psychologists. And what she found was, and she scored those, set it through a computer program that scored it objectively for happiness versus unhappiness. What she found was that the happy psychologist lived six years longer than the unhappy psychologist. Pretty big effect, right? Six years. And she also found that the psychologists that talked a lot about their social relationships lived longer. Uh, so this is impressive. Then she did my autobiography, which she found on the internet. And she said, Ed, Ed, you're the happiest psychologist of all. You're the happiest psychologist of the 75 psychologists I've studied. And I said, wow, that's great. But I have to tell you, I did write my autobiography after I had read your study. <laughs> so I knew I should write a happy autobiography. It's going to give me ten extra, six extra years. So anyway, we have a lot of data of this sort. Here are the data. Smoking might take seven, eight years off your life. Happiness might add six. Exercise is not as important as happiness. And if you eat vegetables, it's way down here at the bottom. If your mom tells you to eat vegetables, don't do it. They're awful. It just gives you one year. They're not very powerful. 
All right, here are all the outcomes of happiness on health. They live longer, they have a stronger immune system, I'll show you in a moment, Str less inflammation, stronger immune system, higher T cell counts, fight off flu, fight off colds, very tight studies have been done on this, exposing people to the flu virus, looking at their happiness and seeing who gets the cold and who doesn't. Less cardiovascular disease, things like strokes, fewer infections, stress and telomere, this is a really important new one, better health behavior. So what are telomeres? Telomeres are the end caps of your DNA. They protect your DNA. So every time your DNA replicates, you want it to replicate right, right? You don't want it to kind of get it wrong, right? Then you're gonna have some real problems. But what happens is the telomeres that protect the ends of your DNA kind of get snipped off as you get older and older and they get shorter and shorter. But what we now know is another thing that snips them off is stress. You can even see it in children Children who are in a family where there's a lot of violence and so forth have shorter telomeres already at age eight or 10. So now you're not gonna live as long and you're gonna get age-related diseases much earlier in life if you lead a stressful life because you're gonna have shorter telomeres. And there's even some evidence to suggest that if you get happy, maybe the telomeres can actually grow again. But that's brand new, we're not uncertain of that. All right, so I just submitted a study the other day with a guy by the name of Bertuccino, which shows that people high in life satisfaction have less interleukin-6, C-reactive protein. These have to do with inflammation. Inflammation is a very primitive uh, way to fight infections. You, when it gets inflamed and swells up, that's a primitive, very aged kind of thing that comes before T cells and all that. But what, and you want that to fight inf a localized infection, but what you don't want is inflammation running around in your body all the time. So if you have chronic inflammation, that means you're gonna be more likely to get autoimmune diseases, you're gonna be more likely to get some various heart plaque buildup and so forth, have heart disease. So inflammation tends to be a bad thing and it correlates with low life satisfaction. Over and over these findings are coming in. Another one is health behaviors. Happy people are more likely to get exercise. Depressed people don't exercise. Happy people are more likely to not smoke, to use seat belts. For example, using seat belts, about nine, it's, a, it's a law in the US. You have to use seat belts, at least if you're in the front seat. 90% of the happy people use it. About 80%, 75% of the unhappy people use them. So most people still use them, but it's enough to make thousands of lives difference in terms of f auto fatalities per year. Nutrition, happy people eat better. Depressed people tend to drink more. They tend to uh, binge eat and so forth more. So all these different reasons lead happy people to live longer and be healthier. Is it causal or just correlational? Now there are a lot of data, and we're just finishing a study to show this, that it isn't just health making you happier, but happier causing you to be healthier. And this would just be one study where you treat, Afri in this case, African Americans, with a, a treatment to make them happier, give them more meaning in life, and so forth, to raise their psychological well-being, and what it does then is lower their blood pressure, because they're hypertensive to start with. And over and over, we're starting to see experiments come in to add to the correlations to suggest it's not just health to happiness, but happiness to health as well in a causal direction. All right, but much more cross-cultural research. This is something that some of you guys should get into because it's wide open cross-culturally. And a friend of mine, Shinobu Kitayama, originally from Japan, showed that anger in Japan is actually related to better health. This was so shocking. But apparently, showing anger in Japan means you're a higher status, more powerful person. It doesn't mean that in the US. In the US, it means you kind of can't hold your temper, right? You're kind of impulsive. But in Japan, apparently, it means something different. And it switches then, which predicts hap which kind of happiness or unhappiness predicts health in the two countries. So down here, that smiling face means all of these areas I've just talked about with happiness and health need research. All right, social life of happy people. Happy people are more likely to marry, stay married, stay employed. I'm gonna show you the data here quickly. We don't wanna run out of time. Here are two individuals 54 years ago, today. 
Today's Halloween. My wife, who's here in the front row with me, Carol, right here, I met her when she was 16. We're 16 years old in that picture. We're now 70. And, and we met on Halloween today. So we're celebrating our... <laughs> We've only been married 50 years, but we've been together 54 years. Now, when I saw her, I thought, wow, she's really good looking. She's cute and all that. And, of course, I was a 16-year-old male. That's all you think about maybe. And, but also, she was very smart. So I thought, wow, she's smart and cute. What, what, what else? Can you, I'll marry her. So <laughs> the thing that I didn't look at, which I should have looked at, which turns out to be most important, is the smile. Because the smile in the yearbook is what predicts how long you're going to stay married. Because if you marry somebody who's a happy person, you're more likely to stay married longer. So several studies now showing it doesn't work for men, by the way. Men, you know, men, all, they all want to look tough and, you know, macho and all this. But women smile or don't smile. And that predicts how, whether they're going to get married, stay married, and not get divorced. So here are our data on that from a German socioeconomic panel, British household panel, shows pretty much the same thing. And what you see here is people who are going to get divorced in the red, people who are going to stay married throughout our study in the black, and here is where they get married, right here. So you can see what's happening is they must meet Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright here a year before their happiness or life satisfaction goes up. Then they kind of adapt back, and they come back to about where they were. The other people, you see, they get married, and then it's all downhill. They get worse and worse. They're going to get divorced right over here. But the point is really right here. Five years before they get married, this group was happier. So it can't be the marriage just making them happy. It had to be that the happiness is what led to them being more likely to stay married. Because, look, way before they ever met the person, they were happier individuals, better social relationships if you're a happier person. There's data showing that uh, people are liked more if they are happy, if they're irritable and angry in pictures or in real. People don't want to inter interact with them more. Look here, Mona Lisa, Mona, I call her Mona Lisa. Uh, Boop, you don't want to interact with her. Happy Lisa. I could show you data from the internet. I don't have time. Whereas people high in negative affect, they use the F word about half the time. They use just awful language, angry language. They use the words like kill, worst, sick, uh, and then nasty words. These people, the happy people on the internet, when you look at Facebook and Twitter, they say family, friends, church. They say all kinds of positive things. It's like, who would you want to interact with, really? All right, so happy people also are better citizens. For example, Mark Sa in Korea found they donate blood more if you're happier. Uh, they volunteer more in our U.S. study. They're better organizational citizens at work. What does that mean? That means they help other people at work more. They're more likely to do things that are not required of them at work. And it's causal. We know it's causal, not just good relations making you happier, not only because of the longitudinal studies, but also experimental studies, because if you put one group in a happy mood and the other group in a neutral mood, the happy people help more. If you drop your books on the, and they're on the way out of the experiment, they're more likely to help you. They're more likely to help people who have an emergency. So we know that pro-social behavior follows from being in a good mood, and depressed people are less likely frequently to do it. Resilience. This is not a study I did, but they found that when something bad happens, and all of us have bad things in our life, everybody has bad things, and so resilience has become a hot topic. How do you bounce back? Well, one of the ways you bounce back is to be a happy person in the first place, and he found that happy people bounce back. Now, the new, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy is something that's supposed to get rid of all the bad thinking of your mind, the negative thinking, and it helps about two-thirds of the people who are severely depressed, but now they find the behavioral activation, getting them involved in things that they actually enjoy, and making them go out and actually do those things is just as important, just as effective as getting rid of the negatives in helping cure depression. It also works about two-thirds of the time. They haven't yet put them together. You figure if they put them together, they might get, you know, more like seven-eighths improvement. 
So what does that mean? That brings us to national accounts of well-being. What that means is that we really need to start thinking about national accounts of well-being, not just because it reflects how a society is doing, be it broader than income, but because it is also a good thing to have in itself. Citizens who are happy are going to do better in general. I didn't show you work life. I'm giving a bunch of talks at NUS about that. But it helps in the workplace, too. Happy individuals at age 18 make more money later in life than depressed people, etc. All right, so here's a very brief history. We won't go through the whole thing. Back in 1990, economists such as our esteemed last speaker in this conference, Andrew Clark, he wasn't one of them that hated me, but a lot of them hated me, some of whom have just won Nobel Prizes, hated me. They said, oh, this happiness stuff is terrible and all that, and now they're doing happiness research themselves. Anyway, in the year 2000, I wrote an American Psychologist article. I said, we really ought to be tracking the happiness of countries around the world, national accounts of well-being to mere national economic accounts. And I pointed out all the reasons that we should do that. And here's a history of it I don't have time to go through. But a big one happened in the United Kingdom in 2010 when the prime minister David Cameron, who's November, I remember it very clearly, came on the TV and said, we are going to start collecting, as a nation, well-being data to help uh, refine policy. And that was huge. And they're tracking positive affect, negative affect, life satisfaction, and meaning in life. And that was a huge thing. Then a lot of people said, um, well, you really can't measure happiness, and it's no good because it's not the government's business and all that. So we wrote, uh, three psychologists and an economist, wrote a book, Well-Being for Public Policy. And this book answers all the objections. If you want to know the objections and our answers to them, they're in this book. The only thing is, I know some of you are having sleep problems now, coming from a different time zone. This is the book for you, because it will definitely put you sound to sleep. It, it actually bores me to death. But it answers all the things you want to know. It is really complete, right, in terms of that. Then another one happened here in 2013. The OECD came out with guidelines to measure well-being. Can you believe it? Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. About 34 of the richest countries in the world, the Rich Country Club, right? And they all have the OECD. And the OECD has a big influence on the statistics those countries take. And they try to coordinate the statistics. So GDP will mean the same thing in America as it does in Singapore or in Mexico. And they came out with guidelines. This is a huge step forward. Now, in the National Academy of Sciences in the US, it's, et cetera. And it's actually been used in the UK and influenced some policies now. So it's huge. About 40, 45 countries have now measured well-being in some form. And uh, beyond the Gallup data, where we had 165 countries. So we've, we've started to make real progress on this. So what do we find? Uh, Wei Ting mentioned some of these things. We find, of course, I told you about already, economically developed countries have higher life satisfaction, very strong. We don't want to say money's not important. Money is important. Economic development's important. It's just that we want to say it's not the only thing. Progressive income tax, it's only one study. We'd want to replicate it and see if it continues to be true, but we found that if countries have a higher progressive tax, that means they have a higher rate of taxation for richer individuals and a lower rate for poor individuals, those countries are happier controlling GDP per person, controlling the overall tax rate. So pretty interesting, but needs replication. But boy, it, it could be big. Human rights are protected, diener, diener, and diener. We found that places where you disappear in the night versus places where they have judges and you know they have rules and they follow the order of law, uh, et cetera. Low inequality, uh, and, uh, and we've got another study just out. If there's redistribution that gets rid of a lot of the inequality, then people are very happy where you have no redistribution and super high inequality, you have low well-being. 
And, and this a new study is from the Gallup World Poll. Again, huge sample. And uh, so it's very interesting because if you have redistribution, every country now is get, every rich country is getting more inequality. It's a very big problem. But what you find is that if you redistribute more, you're going to get over some of that unhappiness that it causes. And a place that Singapore is doing great, low corruption. So that's correlated as well. Then on the environmental end, we find clean air when you get more pollution in Britain, Germany, wherever it is, quasi-experimental, very nice studies showing that air pollution lowers life satisfaction. Green space increases it. I'm proud to say that this place, Singapore, is great on green space for a big city. You see so much greenery around here, and they've increased it just as population has doubled. It's amazing. And they set out to do that purposefully. And so that's really good, and we know that that helps happiness. We know experimental studies on this as well as just correlational. Active commuting. You quit taking a subway or bus or car to work, and you start pedaling to work or uh, walking to work, and that you, we see your life satisfaction goes up. Job programs, Dick Easterlin, the famous economist, showed that if you have more job security so that you have a workman's uh, comp if you're out of work, and then we have job retraining programs and so forth, even the workers are happier, not just the unemployed, but the workers themselves because they feel more secure. Income security programs, Radcliffe has done a lot of studies on income security programs. Again, if you have those, your population is happier. Caregiver programs, if you have a spouse with Alzheimer's, you can leave them off several hours a day, take a nap, go shopping. These programs greatly increase the uh, well-being of people who have an Alzheimer's spouse, for example. So we know a lot about the kind of policies that will increase well-being. How is Singapore doing? Well. In job satisfaction, pretty high, 92%. I was surprised. It's very high. Said they were satisfied with their job. Public transportation, pretty high. Down here, not enough money for food, 5%. That is some time during the year. So that's one of the lowest in the world, the least hunger in the world. Corruption, the lowest in the world. Uh, some places are 100, that, you know, terrible. And how many people want to move away from Singapore? We found only 2%. I was shocked. So Singapore is doing very good in the things that I've colored red. Now, can count on others. It's doing okay, 86. You'd like to see that be up at 100. Healthcare satisfaction, et cetera. Feel rested. We start to fall down here a little bit, like the president said. One out of four people don't feel rested, right? They're just tired. And affordable housing is a, is a problem, apparently, for you. And treated with respect, for some reason that came in a little low. In a lot of countries, that's in the 90s. I'm treated with respect at work. So you can see where Singapore is doing well and poorly. Now, let's talk about future directions. I want to wind up plenty early so that we have time for questions and discussion. So the big one for me, for you, is do these findings that I've talked about generalize across cultures? For example, relationships. What kind of personality and temperament and happiness lead to good relationships, for example, in Singapore or in Malaysia or Indonesia, right? Is it the same? Because most of these studies are done in Western countries, in the US and so forth. So we need a lot of cross-cultural research. What policies will raise subjective well-being in your nation? They might be different from those in the US or, or countries in general. In, in, in a collectivist culture, maybe you don't need as much income support. I don't know, because your family takes care of you instead of the government. So we need more research on each one of these. Beneficial outcomes of subjective well be huge open area huge we need replications not only in the United States but across countries of all these different findings some of these findings there's only a couple studies so we really need cross-cultural and other kinds of replications all right so in conclusions circumstances matter a lot societal circumstances matter a lot if people say why are you happy you better understand that you are lucky because you don't live in countries that are war-torn or starving to death, right, in Africa and so forth. So this is a huge factor. People in the U.S. think, oh, it's me because I'm so great and, you know, they have all this pride and everything. Hey, you're lucky. You were born in the U.S., number one. That's why you're happy. 
Okay, money matters, but it's not the only thing. There's other things we see are very important. Being able to count on other people, extremely important. Having low corruption, extremely important. Having, feeling respected, extremely important for happiness. Subjective well-being produces desirable behaviors and health. This is so important. And monitoring subjective well-being gives information on desirable policies. We can learn a lot by monitoring well-being going beyond whether you're just rich or not. And we're, going, and we're now at that point in Singapore where this society is pretty darn rich. And we better also then worry about some of these other factors that matter in life, not just getting richer and richer beyond here so we can buy, instead of buying a Toyota, we can buy a Lamborghini or something and start thinking about what really matters for happiness. If you want to request the PowerPoints, it's very simple. Probably the easiest way is to Google me, but it's just edener at illinois.edu, so it's very easy. Email me and I'll send you a copy of these PowerPoint slides. And if you want to read more either about the measurement scales we have or about my publications, about 300 of them are on this website and, and it'll, send, it'll mail them to you by email. You can go here, probably you don't need to write that down, all you need to do is Google Ed Diener. It'll be the second or third thing that comes up, Ed Diener's website, and go there and you can get on my website and find all these different resources. Thank you very much. So now I think we have uh, time for questions. Wei Ting, do we have uh, till 11.15 or 11.30? Uh, 11.45. Oh, we have plenty of time. I was rushing too fast. Okay, so we have plenty of time for questions and discussion. And uh, when you uh, give your uh, question, be sure to be very loud. You could say who you are, where you're from, and your question. We have a great deal of time. Yes. Uh, hi, good morning. Uh, Han from Rysense Limited. Uh, I do have an uh, academic uh, interest in this, but I work in the private sector as well. Uh, my question um, uh, with regards to what you shared was, uh, does um, making people aware of how lucky they are, in your conclusions, uh, raise happiness? So does making uh, people more aware of how lucky they are, how fortunate they are, make them happier? And I hope so because, you know, I hadn't taught undergraduates for 20 years, and uh, this last semester I'm teaching undergrads, and they're all stressed out, and they're all worried, and they're all shook up, and I say, wait a minute, do you people know that you have it better than anybody in human history for the last 100,000 years? Do you know that your life is better than a king in the past? Your health care, the house you live in is less drafty. You have cell phone. You have all these things. Even compared to me when I was a child, you have way more than that. You are so fortunate, and you're so darn worried about each and everything. So I'm telling them that and making them how aware of how blessed they are, how lucky they are. Now, does that make them more unhappy or more <laughs> or happier? We don't know. I don't think there's any been research about knowing how fortunate you are in happiness. So I usually try to stick to the data, and I don't know data on that. Mm -hmm. I thought it's quite interesting because uh, if you travel around the world, you know that uh, the people in Singapore have it better than a lot of other people um, around the world, but um, they may not know that. Yes. So one of the nice things about travel, uh, and we just came from Vietnam here, so we've seen a much poorer society. And, you know, Vietnam is coming up, yes, but Vietnam is not like Singapore. The buildings aren't nice. There's a lot of litter around, etc. People live in sometimes pretty, pretty meager housing and so forth. And one of the things it does for me is I think how fortunate you forget how fortunate you are. And so I think that, you know, you travel to Africa, and, and, and we've taken our kids to Haiti, which is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, very, very poor, like Calcutta slums, and it really makes you feel fortunate. So I, I don't know if it works, but it seems like it should. Don't be afraid. Yes. I'm Eddie Tong, I'm from NUS. 
Yeah, uh, so we see a lot of uh, strong evidence that uh, subjective well-being and happiness predict positive outcomes, yes. social and health. Uh, so happy people are healthier and so on. You know, so um, I was thinking, how happy? Could it be that uh, is there an optimum point of happiness such that the positive relationship may go down or yes. stabilize? And I and and I also imagine uh, is there such a thing as extreme happiness? Right. You know. Uh, Good. I cannot... So let me answer that because I got a big answer for that. Okay. Uh, so uh, I was very worried that I was going to rush through the slides uh, too slowly and not have enough time for questions. So I cut that slide out. So I was with the Dalai Lama a couple of times where they have these dialogues, and I said to the Dalai Lama, uh, is it ever bad to be happy? And the Dalai Lama said, oh, yeah, there's stupid happiness. And I said, what's stupid happiness? And he said, if a bear is chasing you and you're happy, that's stupid. You ought to be worried then, right? It's going to help you to be worried to run faster. Well, all the data support this, that there is an optimal level that you can be too happy, et cetera. Let me tell you about it. Well, first of all, let me give you a plug for our son's book. Robert Biswasdiener and Todd Cashden have written a book, The Upside of Your Dark Side. And they point out how occasional negative emotions can help you. Chronic negative emotions, chronic depression, chronic anger, bad. But occasional sadness, occasional worry can actually help you. So all the data show that. For example, creativity. If you have high positive affect at work, you're more creative on average. But if you throw a little bit of negative affect in with it, you're the most creative. So what Shige and Oishi and I found, Shige is at University of Virginia with me and was one of my PhD students, is that there, uh, for social relationships, we didn't find a peak. The, the more positive affect you have, the better your relationships. We didn't find an optimal level. But in other areas, we do find an optimal level. One of those areas Sarah Pressman found is health, that the people who are really, really manic happy, aroused happy, you know, this kind of coming in, hugging everybody, back slapping, doing all that. They're not just contented and interested. And like I, that's sort of the way I feel most of the time, sort of contented, calm, positive, but not, you know, coming, kissing everybody and just laughing and telling jokes. Those kind of people actually had worse health. They had worse cardiovascular health, as though that kind of high arousal happiness actually had bad effects. But what Shige and I found was that uh, for uh, achievement, that is things like income and grades in college, you actually max out around eight on a 10-point scale, and then the nines and tens have lower achievement than the eights. So some, pretty satisfied, but not per perfectly satisfied for getting ahead in the world in terms of making money, grades in college. Now, the last study I'll tell you about is one we did where we had college students who came from all different backgrounds. We had 5,000 college students in the study, and they came from poor backgrounds, rich backgrounds. If you came from a rich background, you're a Harvard kind of kid, happy is good. It really helps you, right? Because you you got so much resources. You, you're so smart. Uh, your parents are helping you. Being very happy was fine. But if you come from the ghetto, your parents are making, say, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year. You come from a poor background. Then being super cheerful isn't quite as good. Being in the middle of the scale. It's never good to be depressed most of the time or really unhappy. We, we've never found evidence that being really unhappy helps you. But for the kids from the ghetto, maybe a little bit more dissatisfaction, not total satisfaction, helped them the most. So now this is, again, an area in need of so much more research because the studies I'm telling you about are sort of, there's not too many of them. But we do have studies that show that negative affects sometimes can help you. It can help you recognize danger in your environment. It can help you uh, worry about a problem and think about it more analytically. So we have negative emotions for a reason, but what you don't want is for them to be chronic and ongoing. You want them to pop, they call it dual tuning, right? Pop up, you deal with it, and then they damp down again. That's probably the most effective. But, you know, they're, they're, so, so optimal level, definitely, especially depending on where you're from, what resources you have, and what outcome we're talking about, social versus achievement. My name is Dilwar Hussain from India. So I have 
two specific questions. One is related to set point theory. Yes. That talks about that, that there is a set point for every individual and beyond that you cannot increase happiness. Yes. Second question is uh, just I am curious to know why you have not done or most of your research is related to subjective well-being and very little about this eudynamic concept of happiness where people talk about meaning yeah. in life and those kind of things. Great questions, thank you. So the first question is about set point theory. Set point theory was originally developed by people out of Australia, Hetty and Waring. They said what happens is each person of us have a set point depending on our personality, extroversion, neuroticism, and we're going along and then a good thing happens to us. We win the lottery. We go up, but then we adapt back down to our set point. We go along some more. And then a bad thing happens. Our wife dies. So we go way down. It may take us a while to come back, but we come back. So over time, our set point uh, determines our long-term happiness. Short-term events can matter. And uh, then the genetic people at University of Minnesota back this up with some genetic twin studies. But we now know that that's an oversimplification, that your set point can change. If you want to read about that, there's a book by Sheldon and Lucas. Sheldon and Lucas have a whole book of about 10 or 12 chapters, and each one of them shows different circumstances that can change your set point. So Fujita and I found in a study we did way back around 92, 93, I think, or maybe it was 96, a long time ago, where we showed that about one in four or one in five people over a 25-year period, 20-year period, their set point changes because we have annual data. So it's not just that they went up, but actually five years in a row, they were higher than another five years. So their set point actually changed. Lucas and Sheldon then show all the different things that do that. But notice that those data that I showed you between two countries, Togo and Denmark, suggest that it's not all just your personal temperament set point. And furthermore, the immigration studies cast doubt on that. And there's a lot more data in that book that you can read. So the set point theory is probably true to some extent. There may be a range in which I can change. I can never become that manic -y person with mania. I could be a little happier or a little less happy than I am now. But maybe there is a range in which I can change. Uh, certainly, life satisfaction can probably change more than positive affect. That may be more determined by my temperament life satisfaction more with my standards. Okay, then the second question is, why have I spent my whole life studying subjective well-being rather than eudaimonic well-being? Now, what is eudaimonic well-being? It's the idea that there's other things that are more important. Marty Seligman talks about PERMA, meaning in life, relationships, uh, achievement, accomplishment, mastery. All these things are important. Nobody ever asked them, how come you're studying eudaimonic well-being? How come you're not studying subjective well-being? I'll tell you why I'm studying subjective well-being, because nobody was studying it. And I was studying in psychology, nobody was studying it, and I was studying it and trying to get it grounded. And you can only do so many things in life. I don't think that that other stuff's unimportant. Some of those people have said, oh, Diener doesn't care about it. Yeah, I do care about those things, but I can't study everything. I'm not studying aggression. I'm not studying prejudice. I'm not studying, you know, uh, the front areas of the brain like Davidson and all that, right? You can only do so much. So I've done a lot on one topic, and hopefully they do a lot on that topic. Now, having said that, let me say something else. Also, our son again with Cashton, Diener, Biswas Diener and Cashton and Laura King have written an article, and they say, you know, those two kinds of well-being are not nearly as separate and clear-cut as you think they are. When we factor analyze measures of those things, they don't come out, oh, eudaimonic well-being and subjective well-being. In fact, life satisfaction kind of gets mixed up with meaning in life and everything. So maybe those things are actually causes of subjective well-being rather than in states in themselves. I don't know. But there are a lot of data now around where you don't find clear-cut factors coming out for the two. So how separate they are, I think that's still a work in progress. But the reason I haven't, I, and we've included measures of it, but I don't focus on it because you can only do one thing. They're focusing on that. Fine, let them do that. You know, uh, well, I won't name her name, 
But she says, why does dinner get so much attention? And, you know, we don't get enough attention on this. Well, they're getting more attention now. And I haven't never seen, and, and then they say, the happiness guys, all they care about is happiness. They think that's the only thing that's important. I've never, ever said that. I've never said that it's the only thing that's important. It just happens to be what I'm studying. And these other things may be just as important. Hi. Uh, oh. Sorry. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Um, my name is Felix. Um, I'm a postdoc from uh, Washington University in St. Louis. I have more, I have a question that is perhaps more career development than research per se. Um, so I'm an academic background too, and I would love to do more research on subjective well-being and ultimately use research on subjective well-being to inform social policy. And I'm just curious, what are your career advices for young academics who want to dedicate their life um, to use academic research to inform policies? Yes, to use uh, research to inform policies. So when I got into the field, it was a dangerous field. I did not start studying happiness until I got tenure. And that meant they couldn't fire me. So what happened was I told a professor I wanted to study happiness. He says, you can't study happiness. You can't measure it. You, you know, and we already know who's happy and who's not. Go away, do something else. So I actually, in that case, went away and did a study on conformity. But when I, <laughs> it's true. It's actually true. But the point here is that when I got tenure, now I was free, right? But I still wasn't totally free because my advance to full professor was held back for about four or five years by older professors in the department who said, this is all baloney, you can't study ha They were all studying depression and negative things, but they didn't think you could study happiness. So, but now, in, starting in 90, 2000, it has changed dramatically. There is no longer. Now, notice that I don't uh, try not to always use the word happiness because, you know, your promotion still has to go to the dean and the provost and the president, and they're like, happiness is sort of flaky. That's why I started using the term subjective well being, right? Sounds, or well being, sounds more scientific, sort of uh, a little solid. But uh, so that's one career advice. Don't put happiness in the title of your papers. Uh, but you know, my, my student at St. Louis U, who is the department head there for many years in psychology, Randy Larson, I mean, he's done great. He won the Young Distinguished Scientist Award from APA, and he was studying emotions and positive emotions and all that. So people are really doing well now, and, and, and many of my students are winning awards and so forth. So I think a lot of that prejudice has gone away. I think, in other words, there will not be a lot of prejudice against you. And if you do health and happiness, oh man, then they're gonna love you because it's a wide open field. Or if you do biology, like I know Wash U is very strong in, in uh, all the neuro, neuro stuff. So you start combining like Richard Davidson, frontal lobe activity with happiness. And as you know, Richard Davidson shows that happy people have a lot more activity on this side of the brain than unhappy people and so forth. So you start doing that stuff and now it's really hot and wide open and, and, and you shouldn't have a big problem getting a job. Now. When you say, I want to convert my stuff to policy, you know, in economics, you're wide open. It's, it's not a problem, because uh, economists just do a lot of policy-relevant stuff. Surprisingly, in psychology, and, and, and maybe uh, uh, more so in sociology, but in psychology, we still, the only policy stuff we've normally done is related to mental health, you know, and, and, and psychological illness. And so you get into the policy things, it's new territory in psychology. And I'm trying to get people to move in that direction, not just mental health stuff where we're treating depression, that kind of stuff, but this broader thing. But it is brand new in psychology. I don't have any reason, though, to think that people will now be prejudiced against it. They just don't know about it and, and don't understand it so much. So many of the studies, if I start talking about studies that I haven't done, other than my former students, you see a lot of those studies would be done by economists because they're so much more involved in the policy. They have a much bigger impact on policy than psychology. It's shocking, you know, psychology is like here and economics is here in terms of impact on policy. So I think we need more in the other social sciences and I want to encourage you to do that. Occasionally it may take a bit of bravery and, and other people might not be doing it, but I don't think they're going to say, well, you don't get tenure or, 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 or you don't get hired because of that. 
Uh, hi, uh, I'm Genevieve from Nian Poly. Okay, so based on your lecture just now um, on subjective well-being, um, more so happiness, right? It's a very broad concept, and each different each individual has uh, distinct and different uh, differences. So, uh, what makes you think that your scale on satisfaction with life, which is a short five item measuring um, the global judgments and satisfaction with one's life and only requires the respondents one minute of their time, um, is able to encompass the entire or measure happiness? Yes. So, you know, I talked about subjective well being and then I ran all my results together as though it's all the same, and it really isn't. But I only do that because of time and so forth. Really, there are very different dimensions, positive affect, negative affect, optimism, the eudaimonic things. And different things predict them, and they predict different things. We don't know very much about the outcomes of life satisfaction versus positive affect. We know very little. Nobody's ever done the really big, good study to separate those outcomes. So we know virtually nothing. In one study, life satisfaction is used. It may be my five-item scale. It may be a one-item scale. It then predicts. But we don't know if it predicts separate from positive affect or it only together predicts or what. And the study, there's like a couple studies that have been done. And their uh, sample sizes of 80. And the two things correlate 0.8 when you correct measurement error. They correlate 0.8, and they say they separate them. You can't do it. There's not enough power. So there's no studies around that actually separate the predictive effects, the benefits of things. But we do know a few things about differential outcomes and differential, I mean differential predictors. So for example, happy countries in terms of life satisfaction, Rich is number one. I didn't show you the slide, but then count on other people comes in two or three. When you look at positive affect, count on other people. That is, in an emergency, do you have people you can count on? That's by far the strongest. Income comes in down around, you know, six or something in the predictors. So positive affect is predicted by quite different things. Negative affect is predicted by different things. For example, insecurity, corruption, these bad things predict negative affect. But when you get rid of them, it doesn't make people enjoy life more. You just get rid of the negative affect to some degree. So different things predict each of those. We need more research on that. We need much more research in the workplace. We have not been yet. A, so we know life, job satisfaction, positive affect, they all kind of predict. A few people have kind of piddled around the edges, but they've never really done the really good studies to separate them in terms of what they're doing in the work, what produces them, and what in turn they predict in the workplace, enjoying work versus satisfaction with work. So there's really a lot to be done in terms of separating out different kinds of subjective well-being. Another different kind is trait versus state. Feeling it at the moment, is that sufficient to be creative? Or, or long-term, happy people, even when they're in an unhappy mood, are they more creative? We don't know. Absolutely do not know many of these questions. You say, well, why didn't you talk about the difference as well? Because of time, but also because we don't know some of those answers. But it's a great area for future research. Um, hello, I'm Crystal from Niam Poly, and I'm from the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. I'm a year one student. So, um, so far you have said like all those on subjective well-being and all that. So I'm curious as to like, um, throughout the entire world, like why has it always been like we have been focusing on U.S. studies? I mean, I understand that, you know, you're from U.S. and, you know, you're American, but like, why has there been so little cross-cultural studies? Is it because it's so hard to study like, oh, how um, Asians predict happiness? Because you said that um, in Japan, anger is actually a better indicate, like it indicates like a better health parameter, but in the U.S., it's like the opposite. So, right. yeah. Yeah. So I did talk quite a bit about U.S. studies. There have been more studies done in the U.S. than anywhere else by far, but there have been a lot of studies done in Asia. Uh, if, if you can make it Thursday at 4.30 over at NUS, I'm going to talk about culture and well-being. And what they did was they put pressure, since I'm talking at SMU and here and over there, they said, make your talk different. So I'm talking about a lot of culture stuff over there and cultural differences and what we know about. You Notice here I showed you some things that predict 
things in one culture, religiosity, but not in another culture. Well, there's lots of those things. There's also the experience of well-being in Japan, and, and Gene Tsai has done a lot of work comparing Japan and the U.S. In Japan, what happiness is, is calm contentment. No negative affect, low positive affect. What happiness tends to be in the United States is much more aroused, excited, enthusiastic. You see all these pictures of them. And even you see it in ads, advertisements. You see it in politicians. You see it in child book readers. Jane and Jack went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. They got a pail of water and they started punching the air and saying, we're excited. And then, you know, uh, Yukiko goes up the thing and gets it and she feels calm and contented. And you see it from the very beginning. So t different emotions emphasize, but they're both positive emotions. They feel good, they're pleasant, but in a very different way. Pride in the United States is a positive emotion. In Japan is a negative emotion, right? It actually flips across. So we do know a fair amount about the, expre the experience of emotion differing. We also know about a few of the causes, as I showed you, like self-esteem differing. We know almost nothing about the outcomes. But if you look at the areas of the world, actually Asia is number two. Well, you say U.S., Europe is, is one, and westernized. And then you look at Asia, and there's getting to be a fair number of studies over here now. And uh, so we're learning more and more. We don't have so much stuff from, from say, Africa, or uh, South America, Latin America, very few studies coming out of there yet. So we are learning some cross-cultural things, but there's much more to know. Uh, and so I would encourage everybody to, 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 to get into it, because, it, it, you know, everybody said, why did you start studying happiness? And I say, well, you know, my parents were pretty happy. And I looked around, and my mom said, be positive, be positive. She would always tell me, be positive. And so I thought, wow, I look at her friends, they're not all positive. Some of them are very unhappy. And even some rich friends of hers were unhappy. And I said, why are my parents happy? And I wanted to figure that out. So that was one reason. But the other reason is when I was looking around at fields, I like, wow, this is wide open. Nobody in psych is doing this stuff. And, and yeah, over in economics a little bit and over in sociology quite a bit. But in psychology, in certain fields, nobody's doing it. It's wide open. And I still feel that way. Yes, we have much more. So in, in Asia and many of the countries coming from, you know, some people want to study, for example, in the U.S., discrimination and prejudice. I'm like, why would you study that? There's a one billion people studying that in the United States. There's not even a billion people there. It's everybody studying. All the psychologists want to study these problems. Where, and so it's so hard to publish on that, to think of anything new. Whereas on the well-being stuff, it's just wide open. And the culture stuff, exactly. Hello, Professor. Yes. Uh, this is Ali El Sahil. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Malaysia. Yes. Um, um, I have two questions I would love to, you know, your, your thought about uh, these two things. Like, let's say about uh, measuring uh, well-being. Um, you are the father of subjective well-being. Uh, I would love to know your thought on uh, objective well-being. What, what you are, what, what you can say about it. And the other thing, um, uh, let's say in, um, a government uh, seek your advice. What would be the five top uh, public policy that you would advise them to, do, to, you know, increase the happiness of their people? Right. Thank you. So, so if I thought about governments, one of the things you got to have is social capital. People have to be able to trust each other, rely on each other, have people they can count on. So important. When you look at countries in the world that are unhappy, they say, I can't count on anybody. They may try to steal my money, right? If you, everybody said, why is Denmark so darn satisfied with their life? You go there and they don't seem all that happy because they trust each other. Very, it, it turns out it's very homogeneous, so it's easier. But they say, you know, if you lose your wallet, would a stranger return it? In Denmark, almost everybody says yes. In some other countries, everybody says no, a stranger would never return my wallet. In fact, my neighbor wouldn't return the wallet. The police wouldn't return my wallet. So Denmark has high social capital, low corruption, f people feel respected. So I'd say, number one, all the different things you can do to foster that. 
Some of those are zoning laws where people get to know each other and can trust each other. Some of those are bigger things uh, in society where you don't think that the rich people are just messing you over, right? That there's some redistribution. They feel like they're treated fairly at least. There's opportunities and so forth. So social capital has to be number one. Now economic development is important too, of course. We know that one. It's got to be there. You've got to have food and housing and, and so forth. And then a third one I'd say is environmental. It's coming up more and more with the clean air and uh, clean water and uh, just having a green space around, so much data on green space. You feel more relaxed around greenery and so forth. Experimental studies, not just correlations and so forth. So I'd say all of those three things, and you say, well, what policies? Well, I have, I have slides. Uh, for, for other talks that show you policies that can affect each one of these things. There's lots of, and I could send those to you, but there's lots of policies that can do things for the environment, of course. I mean, I live in Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City is a great place to live, except the air is terrible much of the year. All you have to do is put scrubbers on those huge smokestacks and those petroleum refineries and require the cars to have catalytic converters. Those things cost money, it's true. But our air would clean up a great deal probably, right? So there's things that a government can do that will do that. Singapore did it for green space. I don't know about the other one, the other parts of it. So, th so those are three things that I would say definitely are very important. And, and you can look at the data of what they show so far and, and get quite a few hints. Um, and what was your other question? Just remind me real quick. Subjective and objective well-being. By the way, I've read your dissertation, so uh, it's very good, very interesting. So um, it's all about the Koran and uh, what it says about happiness. So it's very, very interesting. So um, objective well-being includes things like education, low crime, clean water, etc. We know that certain ones of these things are important for fulfilling human needs, universal human needs. Everybody needs food, so you objectively are able to produce enough food or, or distribute it <coughs> enough food so that nobody's going hungry. Objectively, everybody needs clean water. You drink bacteria, you get sick. Everybody needs health, et cetera. So we know <coughs> many objective indicators. So some people say, well, we don't need subjective well-being because we'll make a list of objective indicators, 20 of them or so. <coughs> the only problem is nobody can agree on what they are and which ones should be in there. So the funny thing is that in the U.S. you see all these academics get together and they come up with you know, these indicators and one of them is you've got to have opera and symphony. You know, and I'm like, wait a minute, I grew up on a farm. There was no opera and symphony on the farm, and my parents never took me to the opera, but I was pretty darn happy, and I think my quality of life is good. They show an elitist bias, these lists, right? And each one of them has that. You know, if you look at, say, drag racing or something that working class people do, motorcycle racing, it's not on the list, right? <clears throat> so one of the problems is who gets to make up the list and what gets on the list and what doesn't. And then how do you weight the list? Is water more important than, uh, you know, symphony and opera? And then some people say, oh, no, you've got to, you know, the mind is more important than the body and all this stuff. So the subjective well-being indicators help you know how to weight those objective indicators. I'm not arguing against the objective indicators. The other thing is that all the objective indicators, people say, well, are the measures of well-being really good? And I'd say they're pretty good. They're not perfect. And I could give many lectures on that. But the objective indicators aren't perfect either. GDP, you know, it's, it's, they've worked on it now for 70, 80 years, and it's pretty good, but it obviously doesn't capture certain things. We do household income. We see where in poor countries, uh, household income differs quite a bit from GDP. Why? Because a guy who's actually just won a Nobel Prize told me, oh, in the poor countries, they kind of just make it up. And I'm like, what? Yeah, they don't have enough money to measure and do all that stuff. And they say, well, it was 300 last year. It's gone up a little. It's probably 400. You know? And I was like shocked by this. And, but he was serious. And, and so the objective indicators, you take crime statistics. 
in the U.S. Crime's a big problem there. We got homicide and these things. But they're far from perfect. Most crime is not reported, like street crime, rapes, etc. So each one of these indicators itself in GDP, you know, you have black market, gray market. A lot of things are never reported, so it's hard to count them. You try to estimate them. And there's a lot of estimates that go into GDP, too, subjective judgments. So. So the subjective well-being indicators, I think, are pretty good. They have a few faults. I think many of those we can correct for, but they're not perfect, but neither are the objective indicators. Okay. Hi. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Adrian from the University of Buckingham in the UK. I'm a psychometrician and senior lecturer. Um, I apologize if you've uh, spoken about this topic earlier. My taxi got lost. Um, but I was wondering about the possible influence of linguistics um, and uh, whether or not the language that we speak to ourselves and others might uh, influence our happiness. Um, the short example that I have, um, I can't remember the name of the tribe, but it's a South American tribe uh, that they've, uh, the anthropologists reported on recently, um, who, um, uh, well, their language has no... Uh, past tense and no future tense. So the idea is that they live in the present and that apparently makes them the happiest tribe in the world. <laughs> Interesting. Well, let me say what I do know about language. One of the things that we have explored around the world is whether language makes a difference in the measures and it can goof you up. So for example, the word happy doesn't really exist very clearly in German. It, uh, the word in German, the closest word, gluch, gluchlich, means something like luck. So if you don't have a word for happy, how do you ask for it? And of course, we ask contented, enjoyment. We ask a bunch of words. So we did this in India and in Japan and the US. And they had certain kinds of words in India that don't exist in the US and certain words in Japan, Amai, and all these words uh, that, that don't exist in the US. But what we found was there's a cluster, a strong cluster of positive emotions and a strong cluster of negative emotions in each of the cultures. And those specific words we don't have in the other culture, they cluster where you would think they would with the positive and negatives. A very few kinds of emotions can shift, like pride, from negative to positive. But there's other emotions, sad, for example, it's always negative in every culture we've studied, and enjoyment is always positive in every culture we've studied. So there's certain universals, and then there's specifics like calm contentment that may be more important in some languages. Now, the, the, the next question is that I can answer is do happy and unhappy people use different language within a culture? And I can tell you about that Facebook, Twitter study. Oh my gosh, young unhappy males you don't want to be anywhere around their Facebook or Twitter. It just shocks me to see how angry and awful their language is. It's just insulting to women, et cetera, just awful. And then the happy people just positive. So they use different language, happy and unhappy people. Uh, one study uh, followed people in their everyday conversations, and they found that happier people have more substantive conversations. They don't just say hi or, you know, how's it going, but they actually talk about real things, not just Twitter. What are you doing? I'm walking to work. You know, they talk about real things. <clears throat> now, the next one is, does language exert an influence on happiness? And I can tell you, I don't know. We know that that's an ongoing debate within linguistics, that the, you know, the Eskimos can notice, or the Inuit notice more kinds of snow because they had 25 words for it and all that. And as far as I can tell, that has sort of gone back and forth, whether the words you know influence what you think. But I would think just guessing that would have to. If you knew a whole lot of positive words like gratitude and that, and not too much negative, uh, it, it seemed, and even acting happy because you've got more positive words to say could make you happier. So one hypothesis is, just acting happy can maybe make you a little happier, and you'd think positive words would make that easier. Now, past versus future tense, I have to just tell you, I don't know. Some people know everything, but I don't. I have to look at data, and I don't know how they figure these things out without data, so I don't know studies on that. Uh, good, good morning. I'm Darwin Rungduin from the Philippines. I'm a PhD student at the University of the Philippines. I, I wonder whether you have, well, you mentioned a little about 
technology, the Facebook and the Twitter, but I would like to have a to, to, to get your thought on the relationship of subjective well-being and technology. Uh, well, back in the Philippines, uh, most of our uh, fellow Filipinos are OFWs, and um, many are reporting also that uh, their long-distance relationship with their family members seem to, uh, well, improve compared before because of uh, the access to communication and um, to, to internet. So I would like, to, or whether you have a data on that. Right. Thank you. So uh, in, in one st so a postdoc of mine at University of Virginia, his name is Costa Kushleff, does a lot of uh, internet studies. And he finds out how, inter how things distract you, you know, when you're driving. Don't be texting. Don't be talking on the phone. Uh, just having a, they have people doing an uh, a attention task on the computer where you have to react real quickly. Just having a cell phone sitting here makes you less good at the task. A little bit of attention is waiting for that cell phone to ring. So there are some things that show bad effects of cell phone. Another one that he's done is you're walking across campus and a clown comes on a unicycle and goes around you in a circle. They ask people at the other side of the uh, square, did you notice anything unusual? And if, if they were just walking across campus, they say, yeah, it was kind of weird. A clown was over there. And if they were talking on the internet, uh, I mean, if they were playing on their phone, one half the time they say, no, was it the buildings? I don't know, no. They didn't even notice the clown. So it can be quite an attention grabber. Now on the positive side, Costa finds that people who are on social media, some are happier. People who aren't on it ever seem a little less happy. It's correlational. And people who are on it all the time, you know, 10 hours a day and all that, that just, a thou I have a thousand friends, but no real friends. That's the problem, right? I'm talking to so many people, but I don't have any in depth. So, so, so I think that, you know, by the time, I, and I, I went away to school for one year and Carol and I were apart and uh, very, very lonely that year. And, uh, but I could call her, so we didn't have the internet, but I could call her. It makes a huge difference, right? So that's before the internet, but you talk about you can communicate with the people. Rather than write a letter and then two weeks later, you get a, you know, or two months later, you get a letter back, uh, you know, or you have to send a telegram. So obviously these things can be a great boon to the happiness of people who are away from the people they love and so forth. But I, I think that a lot of this stuff is, again, wide open for research now. It's really a great area. And as we know, it's just making a huge impact on life. We also find that those Twitters, the unhappy Twitters, predict cardiovascular disease in counties of the US. So the counties where there's all that angry Twitter, they have higher mortality and higher heart attack rates than the ones where you get the happy Twitters. Controlling for income and other things, in fact, the Twitter ratings of happiness are the best predictor, better than income or any other predictor of, ha of, of cardiac uh, problems in a county in the U.S. Maybe one last question. Hi, Ed. Over here. Up here. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, thanks for the very interesting and inspiring presentation. My name's Aline, and I'm a PhD student at University of Sydney. Um, my recent interest has been in perfectionism and unrelenting standards. And with regards to what you were talking about with uh, those who are in the high income bracket, um, not having, well, having their, their life uh, satisfaction scores dipping after a certain point, I was kind of wondering whether perfectionism or unrelenting standard that's striving for more and more and moving the goalposts could account for some of that. And if also that could account for cultural sort of differences um, with cultures who tend to strive harder or place a lot of emphasis on striving harder. Just wondering what your thoughts were on that. Yes. Thanks. So the question is whether standards can keep rising, and we know they definitely can. And so those people who are making 300000 they may be comparing with Donald Trump and billionaires who are making hundreds of millions a year. And so we don't know yet why those people dip down. But what we do know is studies like Carol Graham did, and she found out frustrated achievers. So these are young people who've gone to college, they're in Chile, uh, South America, and they make maybe four times as much as their parents. Their parents are making 10,000, they're making 40,000, and they're unhappy. 
Why? Because they think they should be making 100000 because they're watching American TV and seeing these, well, you know, American TV is not even realistic, right? They show the richest people usually. And so they think that they should be making even more. So if you get TV, especially kinds of TV like that that show a lot of very rich lifestyles, right, then people start wanting more and more. So we knew that, you know, when our parents finally got a car, they were so excited. And if they could buy a house and it was, you know, a little tiny house, they were so excited. And now the, the, the young people are saying, oh, no, 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 I, you know, I don't want a Toyota and all that. You know, I want a BMW, I want a Lexus and all this stuff. And I want a bigger house and I want this and I want that. That's why, you know, we really have a hard time now fulfilling people's needs because people say they're not influenced by advertising, but they are. They want all this stuff. And so our aspirations, I think, have really gone up. And, uh, you know, if you can catch up to the U.S. some, you'll probably get happier. But at the same time, the U.S. and the rich countries are moving up. So you get a higher and higher standard. It's a real question, you know, how much do you need? And for enjoyment, we find that it levels off after about 80,000 in the U.S. 80, above 80,000, you don't enjoy life anymore, right? It kind of takes... You need some money to be able to do things and, and, and so forth, but after that, it doesn't make a difference. So these are the big questions I think we have to face. Now, Wei Ting, it's 1147. Should we stop now or have one more question? One last question. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, hi, my name is Ari. I'm from the National University of Singapore. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Prof for uh, your very interesting um, sharing. Um, the question I have is uh, with regards to um, what you shared about how uh, we could improve uh, our well-being by implementing our policies or perhaps um, some self-initiated activities. Um, I wonder if uh, these policies or self-initiated activities would work for people who are more skeptical about happiness because um, I think in a Singapore context, uh, a lot of us are, are rather competitive and um, kind of skeptical uh, um, and we're also quite concerned with productivity. So um, even if uh, companies um, try to implement our policies that could improve our well-being, um, we, may think, we may think that uh, it's non-discretionary. So um, I'd just like to sh hear your thoughts about this. Thank you. Yeah, so if I understand your question right, you're wondering about these highly competitive people that want to be like Google and so forth. And one of the things you could show them are the data from Silicon Valley. I have it in a slide I gave at SMU. In Silicon Valley, they are very high paid in the computer industry. They have wonderful benefits. They have a Zagat chef on grounds to cook for you. They have a cleaners on grounds. They have freeze your eggs if you want to have kids later. And vacation time is unlimited. Nobody takes any vacation. They're working night and day. They know that it's unlimited, except you're really expected to be working all the time. And what is the happiness rate there? About 20% like their job. 80% do not like their job. And they are the big success guys in the world. How can that be? They don't feel appreciated. They don't feel respected. They don't feel like they're doing something meaningful and important for the world, maybe making up a game or something. They think it's not important. And everything that we know about psychological well-being, they don't have, even though they have all of these benefits, okay? So the first thing you have to say is, why? Why are you doing it? Now, I also work equally hard with those people. I work all the time. I want to work a little bit less now, but uh, at age 70. But the point is, I don't, nobody's making me. I have enough income. I love working. A lot of CEOs are like this. They love working. It, yeah, they may be a little competitive, but they like the job. They, they think they're accomplishing something, improving the world, but at the same time, it's interesting. Uh, the workload is not always overwhelming, just occasionally overwhelming, etc. So there's certain things that we know about rewarding jobs, and I think you can be competitive, and you know, because I publish more than most people, but I love my job. And our daughters don't publish near as much because they like teaching more and so forth. So finding your own niche in the world 
and allowing those niches to exist in the society where not everybody has, if they're a re an academic, has to publish night and day, right? Some people can run administration, some people can be great teachers, et cetera. So I think more niches for more people and some people are highly competitive and maybe they thrive on that. So I think there's big individual differences and at the same time there's certain universals. You better feel respected at work <coughs> You better feel that the other people at work like you, right? Having friends at work. For women, we find flexible hours so that they can work around their kids. They can work their 40 hours when they want is a huge factor in, like, in having them like their job more. So we know a lot about the happy workplace too that, that will improve things. Thank you very much.